Yes. Ed, Costco will take anything back practically no matter how long ago and what condition. And even if you uh, <laughs> didn't buy it there, I think sometimes they've taken that back, but I did buy it there. <laughs> <laughs> if they can find out you bought it, they'll take it back. Yeah, well, we so. uh, took back a vacuum cleaner that we could not have repaired because if they couldn't get it open and Costco had no problem with it. They gave it back as to the last sale price, but they took it back. So. And they'd already used it a lot. I've seen a cheesecake, seven eighths gone return. Yeah, well, <laughs> we still have another year, I think on the warranty or two, no, it's, it's over a year on the warranty left but the manufacturer is being such a pain that I just going to see if Costco will just do it. Are those gladiolas from your garden? Claudia, Me? Behind no. You? No, I wish. No, I'm not a gardener. Not my sister. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I have a whatever's the opposite to a green thumb. Brown. Brown. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Death thumb. All yeah. right. It is it is six o'clock. And is someone who's murdered multiple plants kindly gifted to me by the Pedersons? Um I I long one day to figure out how to keep one of those things alive full term. Um they but, don't need a lot of water, is one thing. Well, I think I keeping my wife away from it helps. I love <laughs> I love Melinda dearly, but after she pruned our peach tree. And I, I came home and, and I was like, what did you do to the peach tree? She's like, I pruned it back. I'm like, it's not a rose bush. No. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, I don't know anything, but I'm the son of a landscaper. So I guess son Connor got picked up. <laughs> Let's pray. Good gracious God. We went through a heavy chapter last week. Complex in its own way. And as we go to this next chapter, that's kind of a part of three chapters that are just, well, it's a burial and kind of the end of the Abraham narrative. Allow us to see within something that most people would skip right over the beauty that you would have us behold, the lessons that we might learn from the ordinary, and the wonder in a man looking for a place to bury his wife. Allow us to see in a chapter devoted to something like this, that even the story of Father Abraham is full of pieces of things that are much like our life. And in that, allow us to see that he isn't so different than we are, even though he is long ago. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, dear souls. Eh, you know, Connie, welcome there too. Uh, good to see you. It's nice to have Stephen. All right. Are there any questions or comments or anything about the sacrifice of Isaac? It's intense. I don't mean to skip right past it. It's kind of huge. Um, but simultaneously, I don't mean to belabor anything. I think we actually did a pretty solid job last time. Yeah. I enjoyed it last week. I know you kept saying how, you know, difficult. This, and I do think it's a difficult chapter, but it's... There's so much meat to it. And what I enjoyed the most is how it how it resonated with the resurrection. And you know what's interesting is whenever I've heard it preached, or even preached it myself, I have never heard it connected to the resurrection that way. And the idea of having to go through the cross or anything else. And um, and what's interesting about Bible studies is how you can take something that I I, when I get ready to preach, like I like this is where I have to go on some of the hard text because I'm like, I'm going to rid it of some of its pain. I'm going to give people hope. And the nice thing about Bible studies is, uh, well, it's all good. Although 
you know, sometimes after one of those things, less people are inclined to show up for the next time. <laughs> this was getting in my way, finally. For the first, I, it, does it bother, maybe it bothers other people when I'm talking and they see it going in front of me. I only watch myself right now. Anyway, yes, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, let's go into the next piece. And we're just going to read this all the way through and, and, it is not something that we can belabor, but we're going to see some beautiful pieces of things if we can. And uh, this is not one of the chapters of the book. It's not a bad. It's actually kind of beautiful. But simultaneously, uh, I want someone to count the number of times we're going to hear God mentioned. And, uh, and, and, and we're just at the end of Abraham's life. Um. Oh, by the way, before anyone starts being like, oh, the NIV or the NRSV, I have issues with translations of both of them, and I will get to that when uh, when we get there. So does anyone want to... Uh, let's do verses one through six. I can read it, and I'm reading for the NRSV updated edition. It's you. You have it all like that. You're you're good folks. Well, I have it online. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm so smart at 77. Way. Okay. Sarah lived 127 years. This was the length of Sarah's life. And Sarah died at Kiria Arba, that is Hebron, the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Abraham rose up from beside his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a stranger and an alien residing among you. Give me property among you for a burying place so that I might bury my dead out of sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, hear us, my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you any burial ground for burying your dead. Amen. And so we get that kind of beginning. Sarah has died. Abraham goes to you know sacrifice Isaac. The very next story, Sarah has died. Not, not that it's... A a big important thing but last week didn't we end before we got to the children of nahar or nahor oh we did uh, yeah okay well thank and, you steve it's just a genealogy but. yeah no i mean like i said we'd read everything so uh while we did those first six verses let me skip backward and we can read uh uh 22 20 through 4 24 and uh does anyone <laughs> Does anyone want to read that brief genealogy? G? Oh, I guess I will. I can butcher it like the next person. <laughs> now, after these things, it was told Abraham, my Milka also has born children to your brother Nahor. Uz, the firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Kimuel, the father of Aram, Jesed, Hazo, Piddledash, Jedlap, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. These eight Milka bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, moreover his concubine, whose name was Riuma, Riuma bore Heba. Gaham, Tahesh, and Maka. Hmm. Oh, right. Thank you Bravo. for that. <laughs> yeah, we didn't do that last week. Thanks, Steve. How dare I? Um, <laughs> and and actually, this is a solid piece because it's not just Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac. We suddenly have a strange genealogy. And, and let's mention the genealogy real quick. It gets back to his brother. Right. Right. So now it's 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 referencing a different part of Abraham's uh, lineage, but not like a child, not like Ishmael. This is uh, his brother. And, and, and why? 
to get to Rebecca. Exactly. So we now have had Abraham go to sacrifice Isaac, and and because uh, he he went through with it, God stops him, tests him, to know that he will do this terrible thing. Um, and rely on grace, the one who comes out of nowhere and does these things. Now, notice in all of this, too, we never said that the sacrifice of Isaac by God stopping him. Like, God, I hate the interpretation that God steps in the nick of time. That's not what this is. And that's why it's important to know the judge's narrative of Jephthah's daughter, too, because God does not step in in the nick of time there. And it's not God doing the testing. It's them testing God. And and uh, so it, it isn't that skippy. It's just that faith and that idea and trust of grace. And in that, then God makes this promise to Abraham that now, like, because of one man's righteousness, his righteousness, his willingness to go through it, the promise now will be continually with his descendants. And in that same way that we speak of the resurrection, we continually get to have life because of Jesus' obedience, not our own. And so God continues to escape after us. Now, after that, you have a genealogy, a tiny little genealogy pop out of nowhere. And as Steve rightly said, it's all to get us to Rebecca. Who's Rebecca? Well, we don't know yet, unless we know, because we already know the story. Rebecca is going to be the wife of Isaac. So now that Isaac is alive, and now that Isaac is this child of promise and child of laughter, and now that Isaac gets to go forth, and even if Isaac isn't his father, and he isn't, Isaac's like, uh, when we hear of Isaac, like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like you're like, Abraham, Jacob, and then you're like, yeah, what's Isaac do? <laughs> Much. Kind of just in between there a little bit, but nevertheless, he's he's the piece of promise, and his own kind of way of things is important as well, and we'll get into that. And isn't it a beautiful thing that you have? Like sometimes I do feel like Abraham, sometimes I feel a lot more like Jacob, and sometimes I do feel like Isaac. And they're very like they're almost like three corners of a triangle of different ways to be. Um, but now you have to get the promise moving, and and in the narrator of whoever put this together last really is an expert time of putting that just genealogy again. And because it's like a whisper that the, that this promise is now going to outlive this couple to whom the promise was given. It's a, uh, you know, like when you're watching a TV show and you get like a little symbol of what might happen in the future, and you don't even know it until you get to it later. Um, that's what's going on. And again, uh, Claudia, it's like, it's like teaching English in these things. This is foreshadowing through genealogy, which would bore most of us to tears, but welcome to the Bible and the God of the universe. And then Sarah's dead. So again, we, we see this piece of Isaac being threatened and this couple given the promise has only the piece of promise given to them at the very end of their lives in Isaac. And then it has to be threatened. And once it's threatened and it's over, God promises past that. You see this little thing. And I'm really glad Steve you stopped us. And then Sarah's gone. And what piece of the promise has been fulfilled? There's a, there's a descendant, and they can come from that. They can keep coming. That's it, though. And this was a pretty extensive, massive promise. <laughs> and the promise isn't just for Abraham. It's never just for Abraham. It's for his descendants and for all the world through him. And it doesn't get to happen in his lifetime. And it certainly doesn't get much to happen in Sarah's lifetime because they're not just promised descendants and they're not just promised blessings and they're not just promised nations and being a father and a mother of many nations and all these other things. They're promised land. And have they any land? 
No. Because we, no. We, yeah, we immediately notice with Abraham when he goes to the Hittites. Now let's talk about the Hittites just very, very brief. The Hittites are very rarely mentioned in the Old Testament. And they're seen here, but Hittites are not Semitic people. They come from like Turkey and their empire of, of modern day Turkey, Asia Minor, Anatolia. And like, and, and, and there they are. And, they, and their empire did not seep down to where he's asking for a place to bury. But we could believe that they had like little enclaves of things as it was just working there. And so they have this little enclave, this place of empire that is, isn't even Semitic. They don't speak the same kind of language. The Hittites had an Indo-European language and the Semitic languages are the Afro-Asiatic languages. So they're very different. And yet here's Abraham kind of with them. He's a, and he says, I'm a stranger and an alien residing among you. Notice his own humility, his own place of things. And it, there's an importance to that. Um, especially at time when we, we start to freak out about the world and what we have to do with the world. And we have to remember that we are not citizens of this world. We are to love the world, but we are, again, not to be in it, but not of it. And so in the New Testament, it will say that we are not citizens of the world. We are citizens of... Anybody? Well, it starts with an H and ends with Evan. Evan. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, in being citizens of heaven, and heaven doesn't mean like the here or on after that as much as it almost means the universe. Like it's it's, it's just kind of this whole way. We are citizens of everything. We, and so not to the ideas, not to the cultures. And and Abraham is still commenting about he's just a stranger and an alien. But he says, give me property among you that I may have this burying place. And that's good. So he's so now he's looking for a place to bury his dead because he has no land. He has a descendant, a descendant, a. A second descendant wandering around. But not the one of promise. And his wife is dead and he has no land. And burial is important in the ancient world. How important is it? Have you ever encountered the pyramids in Egypt? If you had enough money, you made it look really crazy. All right, we got through the first six verses, right? Um. And they and they, we'll, we'll we'll do it all later. I need to just read through this. I can't believe how long we've already gone talking about a chapter. I was worried we would never have enough to talk about. So, uh, <laughs> um, anyone want to read verses seven through eleven? Okay, I can read it. Thank you. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. He said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, son of Zohar, so that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as a possession for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron, the Hittite, the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites of all who went in at the gate of his city. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and I give you the cave that is in it. In the presence of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. All right. We're getting, and notice where they are. They're at the city gates. We didn't know that by now, before now, but we should. Because all of the important business that's done in cities in the ancient, well, this part of the ancient world is done at the city gates. 
Remember how Lot met the three or the two angels um, at the city gates of Sodom? And we'll see other things that are at the city gates. The city gates are important. That's where business is done. And, and Abraham now has come to do business with the Hittites. Um, the Hittites are, are, are confused with the Canaanites in, in, a, in Judges, I believe, or Joshua. But uh, even then, and, and, and they are uh, in, in uh, the descendant tree of things, they are part of the descendants of Canaan that are cursed by Noah. And, and again, look at all the ways in which we've taken scripture and said curse, terrible, and whatever. And look at here how Abraham's acting with these others. He shows up humble. And they say, in verse 5, hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Now, that's the part that I have a problem with the translation. You can certainly translate the phrase a mighty prince. But the word mighty is being translated from a word Elohim. And does anyone, as soon as I say Elohim, know what that word means? Isn't it used like about God? Yes, it, it's God. Yeah. So they're saying you're a prince of God. He says... I'm a stranger and an alien. And they see him in the way that he is. And he's got to have a lot of old age to get here. Like, has, has, he always, has he always been interpreted by others as a prince of God when he's gone to different places? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But we've already seen how terrible it worked out in Egypt. And then when he is dealing with, you know, like, uh, like others... Um, and, and he does the whole thing again and lies to them, it, it works better. And now he's just kind of reached the place where others are saying of him, you are a prince of God. And now there's this odd moment of kind of like finagling just to try to get it. They're like, you can have any place you want to have a burial site. There's not fighting. There's respect. But he knows exactly what spot he wants. And he aims to get it. Why? Why? I have no idea why. It doesn't say. And again, I'm trying to always resist to like add in while simultaneously adding in all the information. Um, in, in the place, the cave of uh, Machpelah, I don't know how to say that exactly either. So I just want to admit, any way I pronounce things, unless I know that I know that I know, most of the time I'm making it up too. So like a Hebrew scholar, a biblical scholar, I am not. I'm just a simple preacher. And uh, that word, we have no idea what it means, but it kind of, we think that it means like, basically the full phrase would be the cave within the cave. And so it's like, it's probably a good burial site because you have, have like a cave and then within the cave, you have like a cave with which you can have more places for burial. And, and, he, and so he wants this and he, he knows who it is and he's reaching out. And again, the Ephron here says to him, like, I'll give it to you. And we're like, all right, no, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field. I will give you the field and I give you the cave that's in it. In the presence of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. This is letting everybody know that whatever Abraham's about to get is his forever. It's being done in a city gate. It's being done with the people who are in the land. And the first time Abraham gets any land, the only moment that Sarah gets to get the piece of the promise of land is in her death. Are these the way we like our religious promises? <laughs> and and evidently, potentially Abraham's place of burial at this point, they would assume. I will, I will, I will give you a, a note. Yes, it's a, where Abraham is buried. It's where Isaac is buried. It's where Rebecca is buried. It's where Jacob is buried. And it's where Rachel is buried. 
basically anyone who dies in Genesis, who is a part of this family, is going to be buried here. They may be wanderers and strangers, but the first time they get a piece of land is in this odd, strange moment. And it becomes the place where they all get to be rested forever. And the promise for land is best filled in their death. Now, we also think that this chapter was written by the priests who were writing their pieces during the exile. Why might this be a hopeful story for those who are in the exile? That there is land that belongs to them? Even if it's a land that they only get in death. But they will be home. They will be home at, in in death on their land. And so it gives them a memory of something, and a memory that also lets them know that it's not going to work out the way they want. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't work out in a way that fulfills the promise. It also gives them. Father Abraham self-identifying as a stranger and an alien. And as they feel like strangers and aliens in a foreign land, they get to have Father Abraham on their side again. And it also gives them a story of how Abraham is acting kindly and yet being acknowledged as this God priest or God prince the prince of god and it inspires them to try to live in a way like father abraham as opposed to simply try to fight and tear everything apart and we got what through 11 mm -hmm. all right let's read 12 through 16 Well, I can do it again. Sweet. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. He said to Ephron, in the hearing of the people of the land, if you only will listen to me, I will give you the price of the field. Accept it from me so that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? bury your dead. Abraham agreed with Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver according to the weights current among the merchants. So this is how he goes about buying it. He's having this whole kind of thing, and they're trying to give it to him, but he doesn't want to have it given to him. He wants to buy it. He wants to buy it. Why does he want to buy it? Uh, what's given can be taken away maybe perhaps what's given can be taken away by another he doesn't want anyone beholden or he doesn't want to be beholden to anyone because if someone gives you something what often happens they change their mind they might yeah. change their mind or have you ever had someone give you a favor which was at first a gift but suddenly became a favor or they reminded you constantly of the gift they gave you when they asked you to do a bunch of things for them he, he did the same thing with the king or whatever it was of Sodom. He wouldn't yeah. take anything. He doesn't want to take things from people when he doesn't need to. And also, let's be honest. This is his wife. She lived to 127. He's over 130. I don't know how old they were when they got married, but you have to imagine that they were 100 plus years in the past. <laughs> Do you want, he's looking for a place to bury his wife. 
he's grieving. And I think that's important. And I, I, I skipped right by it because I wanted us to read the whole thing, but I can't help myself anyway. So like, it, how important is verse two? And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Why is that important? Mostly because we live in a culture that doesn't want to grieve. Hmm. And we live at a time religiously where our tradition has forced us to say we shouldn't grieve because it's their freedom. Oh, they're fine. Why are you crying? Get over it. Don't be in pain. Shut up. He gets to grieve. We have a whole chapter devoted to him finding a burial spot for Sarah. The next chapter will be a whole chapter of trying to find a wife for Isaac. And the next chapter is him dead. He had to be tested. He's given a promise for his descendants. He now wants to grieve his wife. He wants to honor his wife, not being given something. And 400 shekels of silver, isn't that an interesting thing where like Ephron says, ah, what's 400 shekels of silver between like us? Well, it's 400 freaking shekels of silver. That's what it is. And that's not a little bit, that's a lot. It's a fortune. <laughs> and, and he weighs it out in front of everybody so that they can see that it's his. And this, in the weird grace of God, the strange alchemy of how God's providence flows in our world is how they first get the promise of land. A strange little moment at city gates of Abraham having a business discussion with the Hittites. And I'll just finish it up. Verse 17. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area passed to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites, in the presence of all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, facing Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it passed from the Hittites into Abraham's possession as a burying place. Now, again, if, if the scholars are right, and I think they probably are, that this is a priestly document. And we know that that was written during the exile, and you all did an excellent job of already, why might they do this? Again, that... It, this is the first moment, the first moment, the first moment in the narrative that now there is tangible land. And it wasn't because of conquering. It had nothing to do with violence. It wasn't retribution. It wasn't anger. It wasn't wrath. It wasn't divine punishment. It wasn't any, it was a man grieving his wife. A man who's allowed to grieve. Every time someone wants to do a funeral, they always tell me the same thing these days. We don't want a funeral. We don't want a memorial service. We want a celebration of life. We don't want to cry. We don't want it to be sad. We want it to be joyous. And I always tell people the same thing. We will celebrate your beloved's life. And yet, I will not and cannot promise that it will only be happy. I can actually promise that I will make you cry. And they're like, oh, I don't want to.
Why? Why are we afraid of pain? The pain of loss? Why are we afraid, not just that we're experiencing the pain, but that we want to deny that the pain is there in the first place? We don't want to be observed being in pain. Amen. We don't, right? Because why do we want it not? To, why do we want to not be observed being in pain? Somehow that's weakness. Oh. Why don't we want to be weak? Un-American. Oh, it could be un-American. You yeah. don't like to appear, oops, maybe. Yeah, you don't like to appear vulnerable. Right. Out of control. Better way of saying it. And so when we out of control or vulnerable or something. I got this. Yeah, we got this, right, Bruce? Yeah. But we don't. Not one of us doesn't feel like a child when we face the mystery of death again. Right. And so we pretend we're adults and we make believe a kind of faith that refuses to allow us to grieve. And yet in the Bible is a book called Lamentations. The shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. And when Abraham suffers the loss of his beloved. He went in to mourn for Sarah and weep for her. Is it easy? No. Is it honest? Is it vulnerable? Is it healing? Rumi once wrote, the pain is the antidote for the pain. I have to admit, my parents died one week apart, literally one week apart. In February, middle of February. And it wasn't until mid-summer that I realized that I had been depressed that whole time. And I'm not a person that's depressed. So I had so suppressed all of that, that it just caused me to go through these months of depression that I didn't even recognize. It was how much of our life is us layering ourselves with mask after mask after mask to present to the world that we have it all altogether how many people are willing to fully love their broken imperfect vulnerable mushy flesh bag body endlessly aging into dust how many of us have the grace to age in a way that we need to accept help from others because we can no longer do it ourselves so Instead, we go kicking and screaming and furious that, that things are falling apart. Why? 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 Can the doctors and the nurses do all their magic to keep me going for as long as ever, healthy and strong? There's people trying to figure out how to upload their conscious to computers so they can exist forever as a conscious in a box. Because we're afraid of life. And he grieves. And in the midst of his grieving, too, this beautiful place where he comes again as a stranger, as one, because he must feel like a stranger, too. And that's, again, really honest. Have you ever felt like a stranger in the world? Yeah. Just a little bit? Mm -hmm. Have you ever just woken up and uh, the whole world is crazy? 
Well, maybe you're just like, nah, nah, I'm at home here. And in which case, God bless you. Like, I, I figure it out for the rest of us. That'd be awesome. I'm an alien residing among you. He's an alien residing in a space of promise that he's barely seen. That he keeps being whispered to of. That he got one moment that it's true, and then he gets to sacrifice this one, but he trusts that maybe it'll be okay, or whatever happens, it'll still work out. And then after it works out, he gets a promise, his wife is gone. We never get to see a moment outside of Isaac's birth, his naming day, his sacrifice, and that's that's, that's it. We, we only see two moments of Sarah with Isaac, his birth and his naming day. And that's all she gets. So much of our faith, and I, I said in my sermon on Sunday, um, ours is a patient faith. And I only really know I said that because somebody asked me about it later. What do you mean? Ours is a patient faith. I'm like, well, we're not necessarily patient people, but that doesn't change that God's not on our time. And what's the beauty of trusting in God in the midst of things not coming to fruition? I suppose it might be that those who see us, even though they're different from us, and we say that we're just a stranger and an alien, they'll say, no, you're a prince or a princess of God. Hmm. Didn't say he's a prince of some part of land. He's a prince of God. And yeah, he wants to buy it. And yeah, for hundred shekels of silver is a lot do you think he cares about the price of it at all no. do you think that he knows what he's doing is in his own little way of finagling it's the promise of the fulfillment of land and it's a speck of land it's about 19 miles south of jerusalem There's still a mosque now built on this cave. Depending on the time of like, you know, since Jesus, it was either a, a church or a mosque. But, and then now it's like part temple because, you know, Israel. But if this story, even if it was only written 2,600 years ago, and it's talking about a time a thousand years before that, the memory of these people has always been that they were buried there. And, and now in 2024, there's monuments of worship for three different traditions on this cave that Abraham bought a long, long time ago to grieve his wife. And it became his home. And it became his son's home. And it became his daughter-in-law's home. And it became his grandson's home. And it became his granddaughter-in-law's home. And in the end of Genesis, the people of promise are going to be in the land of Egypt. And what's going to happen while they're in the land of Egypt? Joseph's going to die. Well, Joseph's going to die. And then after Joseph dies, what gets to happen to him? They get to leave. <laughs> <laughs> after 400 years of slavery this is the 
I mean, I like to see things, you know, like, don't you like seeing stuff happen immediately, 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 immediately. My God, I remember my, my first church because people were like, there was a foundation and a rich guy paying my salary. I had to have goals. And I, at the end of every year, I had to show that those goals were, were being met because it had to keep the money flowing in. So they needed things happen immediately, immediately, immediately. And, and I appreciate that. You need things to survive a little bit, but it takes us away from the genuineness of our faith that things don't work that way. And because we act like they do when we live in a society and in a culture that wants immediacy, that wants not to grieve, that wants to think that we have it all together, that does not want to exist in the mystery, the sovereignty, and the providence of God. Where even those who claim Christ want nothing to do with the way of Christ. They want the resurrection without the crucifixion. They want the blessings without the storms. And here is the story of how the land is initially brought. It's through death, and the only people who get to have the land are those who die, and they won't even get it for another 500 years. What if I told you in church? Not to mention, what's the first season in the Christian calendar? No. Lent? It's not uh, similar to Lent, but it starts with an Advent. A. Advent. Advent. Oh, duh. <laughs> oh, don't be duh. You don't need to know these things. It's all right. We forget it part. And it just kind of keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. But Advent starts the Christian calendar. What is the season of Advent? Leading up to Christmas. Yeah. Waiting. No, leading up to Christmas. But it's not just leading up to Christmas. We want it to lead up to Christmas. It's the season of preparation. And let's even say, we can say preparing, but more realistically, it's the season of waiting. Well, that's true. But why don't we call it the season of waiting? And why, if I were to like, you know, like have us wait to Christmas, we all lose our collective minds because of course, society starts celebrating Christmas in September. (laughs) Right after the 4th of July. Yeah, we don't want to wait. I mean, could you imagine if I was like, man, I really want to see Links in a whole lot. Like, let's have him three and a half months beforehand. Pull that kid out of the womb. <laughs> <Can't> wait. <laughs> Trust me, that would have been a choice if I had one. <laughs> Amen. Because again, what's the problem with it is it's waiting and it's hard. And the calendar knows that waiting is hard. It starts the new year with waiting. And yes, the preparation of waiting, and the preparation is not giving up. Is pressing on. Is keeping the faith when the faith is hard to keep. And this was the message of Revelation. The last book of the Bible is keep the faith. The first book of the Bible is there's a promise and you're going to have to wait. And the last book of the Bible is keep the faith. You're still going to have to wait. And Advent, if you pay attention to the lectionary of Advent, very, very preciously little of it has anything to do with Christmas. Yeah. What's it have to do with? Well, it has to do. It ha- yeah, the, the coming. Jo- Joseph, ready for Jesus coming again. How long have Christians been waiting for that? Thousands of years. <laughs> Almost two thousand four years, and we're still waiting. And because we don't like waiting, we don't even pretend it's about waiting and preparing for the second coming. And thereby, the idea of Christmas isn't just the birth of Christ 2,000 years ago, but the birth of Christ anew in our moment. Yes. We hope for. But we've turned it into a celebration. 
and the so is society. And now the best parts of church are just upset that people have to say the most parts of church, not the best parts of church, the worst parts of church. They're just upset that people say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. Get over yourself. <laughs> if you're not going to be upset that people aren't saying it the way you want it to be said. And it's my home. You know, there's a lot of holidays going on right about there. Holiday means holy day. And there's a lot more people than just you. And at least Father Abraham has a little bit of humility in front of others who aren't like him. Christians without humility are Christians without Christ. And a Christian without Christ is Ian. Just like that. I'm the only one who likes it. People are like, what the hell does it mean? Well, Christian take out Christ, Ian. Ian. <laughs> and Abraham is waiting and he just wants to bury his poor wife. And it's that point, a grieving man with a promise, looking to bury his wife, pays the full price of a field and a cave so that he can bury his wife bury my dead out of sight. And you hear out of sight and you're like, wait, what does that mean? It means bury them and not just keep them above ground. Like, it's not like I, I don't ever want to see her again. No, this is the place he's buried. This is the place that his two sons are going to come back together to bury him. This is the first place that he gets to own. It's the plan being promised and fulfilled. It's the moment that he gets the opportunity opportunity to have a place where Sarah finally gets to rest. She's been a wandering pilgrim, much like him. Hearing a promise, getting Isaac. And I, there's the rabbinical story that, that an angel or a demon whispered to her what happened with Abraham and Isaac while he was leaving. And that's why she immediately died of a broken heart. And what if that's actually the way this ends? That's a tragic, terrible story. Now, that's not the Bible. That's not what Genesis is trying to tell us. But it's telling us it isn't easy. And it's getting us ready for the next generation. Be fruitful and multiply isn't make sure you have as many kids as possible. It has more to do with don't forget those who come after you. Don't be the selfish generation that thinks it's all about you and you're the one who has to figure it all out. Doesn't every generation want to be the generation that figures out world peace when they're young and idealistic? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And then it doesn't work. And then they're bitter. And then their hearts get hard. And then they're in it for themselves. What can I get out of this life? Not Abraham, not the people of promise. They know that ours is a patient faith. They know they continue to trust in God. And in that way, they be people who are in the world as strangers and aliens, but they are not of this world. They are citizens of heaven. They are princes and princesses of God that live in a different way and show people a better and more interesting, more beautiful way to live in this world than be bitter and figure out what you can pull out of it, but to be a blessing to those who come after you. We aren't doing that particularly well at our time at all. People don't like th those who hoard the most wealth and do whatever they want. Don't care about what we're doing at all to the planet. Don't care at all about those who come after us. Make believe that everything they hear is make believe. So they don't have to deal with it with any sense of respect and responsibility. Because how dare we give up any of our comforts? It's our divine right. No, it's not. 
Our divine right is that we are promised, that we are a blessing to the nations. Are we Christians a blessing to the nations? Are we going into all the world, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded by our example of how that's lived out so that others might know what it means to be a follower of the way, to have a patient faith that does not insist on its own way, that is not irritable or resentful, but knows that love is patient and love is kind, that it doesn't insist on its own way, that it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things so that others might know that there is a better way in this world than the ways that we are living. And now we can't even grieve at our own funeral services <laughs> because we don't want to be vulnerable, because we don't want to feel that love includes a broken heart. Love that can't experience pain isn't love, it's pleasure, and pleasure has nothing to do with love. A funeral service that doesn't want to cry is a resurrection without a crucifixion. Mm -hmm is a laughter without a sacrifice, without a promise. Didn't God, I mean, am I remembering this wrong? Weren't, didn't God rend the heavens when Jesus died? Well, the I sun mean, stopped shining for three hours. Right, but my point is, is that God grieved. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I remember telling my friend who's, father was on hospice last year and his mom died a couple of years ago and he's my age and now he's 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 a motherless child and i feel terrible that i like you know like i have i get to have healthy parents that i get to talk to i'm gonna go visit next week i get to see all of my siblings and all of their spouses and my nieces and my nephews and my poor friend's sister is like AWOL and got issues. His mom is dead. His dad. And he's trying to tell me I have to be strong. And I said to him, a son is allowed to grieve. For even the sun stopped shining for three hours. When the father saw the sun... And what does grief give us? gets us to embrace the full cycle of life, the realities of existence. It keeps us from being able to hide. It forces us to deal with all of the world, to learn to love even the hard things. Maybe it's easier for me. I, I feel like you you remember when Jesus was like being going over to Jairus' house and his daughter dies before Jesus gets there, and there's professional mourners who are there. And we're like, who are professional mourners? I'm pretty sure that one of my like job descriptions should be professional mourner. <laughs> like it's like uh, it's, and people need help with it. And when I go into the worst moments of people's lives and I'm invited into tragedy and terror, mm -hmm. 
no one who is experiencing the reality of loss in the moment has ever asked me, can we just celebrate the life? Because in the moment, no one's worried about celebration alone. Celebration is great, and it's a part of it. But we can't take out the grief. Because a heart without grief and celebration alone is a heart that will grow hard by the difficulties of the world very quickly. And perhaps because the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. And the first thing that Abraham does upon the death of his wife isn't try to secure this burial spot, isn't try to work it all out, isn't try to stash away the grief until he can deal with it appropriately. It's to meet the grief head on as if it's a welcome friend. I remember, and I probably told you the story before, but I'm going to end this kind of way. When I was a hospital chaplain, there was a fellow whose wife was in the hospital for about three and a half weeks, and she was just kind of slowly dying, but he couldn't take her home. And everyone knew that, even though we were kind of thinking it would go quicker. And he came every single day, the moment like he seems to woke up. And he was there from like 6.30 in the morning till like 7, 8 at night, and he'd go back home, and then he'd sleep, and he'd come back, and he was by her side and he held her hand and as a chaplain I got to interact with him fairly frequently and when she passed away I was the chaplain on call and I went in to help him fill out the paperwork because that was a chaplain's duty where I was a uh, chaplain and then again he, he he leaves and I thought I'd never see him again and apparently he came back the next day and he stands in the doorway and he looks into the empty room because it hadn't been filled yet where his wife was and they weren't sure what to do and he walks off after about 15 minutes or so and, and then again he comes back the next day and now there's someone in the room but he's standing in the doorway just looking into the room where his wife had been for the last three and a half weeks of her life and he was there every day with her and he doesn't know what to do so. but now because there's someone in the room and they can't have him just standing there they call the chaplain and I happen to be on call again and I just go and I just stood next to him looking in the room now, if we were going to be there for a while, it's going to be like, man, we can't just stare at this person. But it didn't take long because there's something about being quiet. That just don't run from the grief. And it's hard for us. And I'm so glad that God saw it fit to make sure that I'm a professional mourner, that I'm not allowed to run away from the grief. Because it's in the grief, I've experienced the fullness of love that makes me know that love is much more profound than I will ever understand with words. And I stood next to this fellow. And he knew me. And he didn't look at me. And he suddenly said, Chaplain, If she's dead, why am I still in love with her? And that's why we grieve. Because grief is proof that love is stronger than death. And to skip right into celebration, we ignore the proof that love is stronger than death. And that's why death can be the impetus for which these people get the first piece of land. Because love 
is stronger than death. And this is why the people of the ancient world are taught to be a blessing to the future, to be fruitful and multiply, to ensure that their future generations are a blessing to the world, not to ruin things, but to live for the future people as well, because they love those that come after them, because even though they know they won't be there, they know that their love is stronger than their death. And there's no wonder that nearly 4,000 years later, three traditions put a holy spot on a place that Abraham bought to have so that he might weep his wife when he wondered if she's dead. Why am I still in love with him? Because all three of those traditions that look at Father Abraham and Mother Sarah as theirs, well, maybe not the Islam, the guy the same way, but even they, they recognize the joy of it. Sarah's important in their tradition. They want to remember the spot where God's promise first took root in a moment that love was stronger than death. All of this to get past Abraham. This is the beginning of the end of Abraham's story. Has it been as glorious as you were expecting it to be? It's been good. Or has it simply been more realistic? <laughs> or <too>. human. <laughs> so stop bemoaning your humanness. It appears, though, that's exactly how God works. By the way, did anyone count... The number of times God is mentioned in chapter 23 for me? I don't think ever. Yeah, not once. Isn't it fascinating that they receive the promise of the land and God isn't mentioned once? So just because God isn't mentioned in things doesn't mean that God isn't there. And God's not mentioned once here when they get the first land. It just gets to be a deal among a grieving widower and a bunch of people who look at some guy who thinks he's a stranger and an alien and says, no, we know who you really are. You're a prince of God. <laughs> Chapter 23, y'all. We'll do chapter 24 in August. The wooing of Rebecca. It's 67 verses long. If we get through it in one day, we'll probably, well, who knows? I have no idea. It's really long. <laughs> but, you know, Genesis isn't quick. And so it'll be in 2025 that we finish. Maybe a year from now. <laughs> okay. But uh, thank you for joining with me in a passage that most people would ignore and have no idea that while there seems to be no theology in it, it still is just a thing full of blessings because it reminds us in the ordinary, well, that's the, that's the longest season in the church calendar too, the ordinary year. Yeah, ordinary. The thing where nothing special happens. The, the story of Abraham though is kind of like proof that God provides he didn't come down and push the Hittites out of the way he provided for Abraham Abraham didn't worry about his wealth or anything he just got it God provided him the means to buy the land and that is again what we learned from last week we have a God who tests and a God who provides unfortunately in our time and place we want a God who doesn't test and we'd rather provide for ourselves. But then we wouldn't be strangers and aliens. I'm taking that whatever our alarm is going off on side, it's God's way of saying, shut up. <laughs> 
I wrote out a sermon that was supposed to be 20 minutes. It was my fifth draft on a terrible day on last like Friday. And it went for 30 minutes. And I'm just like, sweet Jesus, how is that even possible? I'm just longer and longer winded, longer and longer. -winded. So I'm going to stop. God, thank you. Amen. Okay, that's a great closing prayer. I hope you guys have a beautiful evening. And um, thank you for joining me. And thank, thank you, you for joining me within this. I, I keep getting surprised by how beautiful I think things are. Because I was like, this isn't going to be quick. Or it's going to be super short. What a short Bible study before we take five weeks off in July. I'm like, no. It was so glorious. Thank you. How are you all? You, have, you all have a beautiful evening wherever you might be. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.